Hello and welcome to Tales and Trails. I'm Minnie Menon. You can't understand history, economics or politics without studying maps. Neither can you fathom the distance early man travelled as he stepped out of Africa 70,000 years ago. How did he make his way all the way from Africa to the tip of South America? And what was the world like then? Those are the questions I asked Harvard-based cartographer Jeff Blossom, who's worked on National Geographic's epic initiative, The Walk Out of Eden. Take a look. Well, the, the journey started for me in, in 2012. So, so I'm, I'm with the Center for Geographic Analysis. And what we do is we, we support research and education at Harvard University. And in 2012, um, a man named Paul Salapek, uh, a reporter, he was at Harvard and so he emailed me and, and said, I have this project where I'm walking the path of, of human migration. And he said, I need maps and I need someone to help me with maps. And so, so that's where it all started, mm -hmm. is, is with this, uh, this project that he calls the, the Out of Eden Walk. Right. Let's talk about the Out of Eden Walk, right? I mean, this is 70,000 years ago. The known world is very different. Um, you know, there is more land, the sea levels are low. So I want to know, as a cartographer, how did you actually look at this period? How did you reimagine it? So it started with, with research and trying to figure out exactly what, um, what sea level was like back then. And so there's, um, you know, there, there's several different reports on, on, on uh, the, the actual, you know, the, the depth that sea level was. At that time, there was a lot more ice on this planet, and and that um, contained, a, you know, the, the water was contained as ice, and so that meant there was less water in the oceans, and so there's there's different estimates, but most estimates come out with something around 100 meters below what it is now, um, and so how to map that with with cartography is is using two different data sets. One data set is modern elevations of, of modern land. And the other data set is the, uh, the depth to the ocean floor. Mm. And so this was critical in, in showing land that was exposed 70,000 years ago. So this data that, that tells us how deep the ocean floor is, is called uh, bathymetry. And bathymetry um, has been measured for um, 150 years or so, there's been lots of measurements to the ocean floor. I'm going to come back to that. I'm, I'm very fascinated by that. But I want to know what the known world was like 70,000 years ago. From what I see, it was a continuous landmass almost. And that's what allowed the human migration to happen over, over 60,000 years because they were land bridges. So uh, explain to us what you found different in the world 70,000 years ago. So the, the major differences um, were, were where Asia, comes to um, comes close to the North American continent, and so that is all all very um, very shallow today. But it's underwater. So there was a huge land bridge connecting um, the extreme eastern part of Asia with the western part of North America. Some other major differences were in in, in the Red Sea, the Straits of the um, Bab el Mendeb. That was also um, a land bridge, mm. and then around the the UK in Europe. That was all land as well. So UK was not an island? No, UK was connected to continental Europe and there have been archaeological explorations in modern times sure. on ships where they send down um, boring devices that, that dig into the ocean floor and they're bringing up sediment that has um, evidence of, of settlements in those areas. Mm. And of course, um, marine archaeology is the most fascinating area because there's so much that we don't know. I'm also going to talk to you about uh, Australia. There was a lot of excitement when, uh, when early archaeologists and anthropologists you know, studied the Aboriginal communities and realized that they were part of a very early migration because Australia was uh, still part of a new world uh, because of its distance. Uh, this clearly shows that there was, again, the islands were connected in, in some way and there was a land bridge to Australia. That's right. So if, if, you, if you reconstruct uh, land at that period, you'll see from, from Southeast Asia um, heading, heading south 
all those islands that include um, you know modern day Indonesia and and Papua New Guinea. Um, there was a land bridge connecting all those to what is now the the continent of of Australia, and so um, those then, as sea level rose, you know, slowly became islands. But at the period when when humans got there, which was roughly fifty thousand years ago, forty five to fifty thousand years ago, they were able to uh, to walk um, that way. And what's really interesting to me is. You know, the Homo sapiens uh, species dates back a couple of million years, but it, for some reason at around 70,000 years ago, um, they decided to walk. So Homo sapiens originated from, from, from primates in, in, in Africa, and, and so for some reason at 70,000 years ago, our species became curious and started migrating, and over a period of, of thousands of generations, we eventually populated the world all the way down to um, the tip of South America. Of course, the desertification of Africa was seen as one of the main reasons. Now, this is the map of the world. Now, have you looked at the climatic map over a period of time? Because, I mean, you're looking at multiple ice ages, periods of thaw, the entire landmass is, is rapidly changing. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of work done on how Europe was a marshland and, you know, all of that. So. What sense are you getting? How far was the ice pack, the ice uh, range at that time? Well, you know, the, this time period that the humans migrated from, you know, from 70,000 to uh, 12,000 years ago or so, there were several ice ages. Mm -hmm. So the ice caps would, would um, you know, would, would advance and recede. And, the, and at this point in history, they're, they're about as, as small as, as they ever were. But they actually extended all the way down into you know, covering what is now Siberia and Russia, um, you know, down, down into, in, into France. And they didn't, they didn't come much further south than, you know, Central Asia and, and, and France in terms of in this, in this part of the world. Um, but then, like I said, it's this dynamic thing where every few thousand years they would advance and retreat. And this would open up um, avenues for humans to then migrate across, you know, Central Asia and Western Asia. Mm -hmm. And it also had the effect of, of pushing the Neanderthal species who, who lived further in the north down into contact with, with humans. So that was one of the, the, the things that, <clears throat> that our species had to deal with as it, as it migrated. So let's look, talk about the Out of Eden walk. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a walk that, was, that took 70,000 years. Uh, so it was, it was a long walk. But, uh, and when Paul is kind of re-looking and retracing that path, He's, of course, taken a, a different route, which you have charted out. So how have you charted out this route? So originally, when, when Paul was describing his, his walk to me and how he wanted to show the, the path of, of human migration, um, I created a map that was, was very, very generalized and just showed a very generalized path. And, and so using that, I used um, some different cartographic methods to show that this was not just one continuous journey. It started and stopped. It, it moved in, in bands and waves and, and spread in, into different areas. Um, so, so that's what I tried to show with this, this greatest walk map that I've made, that it was um, you know, very much vague in, in a lot of different areas. Modern day now, he's walking and he's carrying a, a GPS device. So he sends me those coordinates and so I know exactly where he is. But unlike um, our, our ancestors who hit ice ages and you know, tribes of, of Neanderthals, he is, is having um, some modern day inconveniences, mainly trying to get visas to different countries to walk through those. And climate also affects him. So if he comes up to a mountain range in November or December, then he'll stay in that city for the entire winter and then he'll continue walking in March or April when, when it thaws. Mm. So I'm going to ask you, um, it's a long walk. I mean, he started in 2000. 21,000 miles. Yes, 21,000 miles. And he's uh, in India right now. Right. And he's going to be in India for some time. Uh, what was the most difficult part of charting this course? Um, the most difficult part of, of, of me charting this course is, is really um, just getting, getting his data from his GPS that he's carrying. Because he'll go for several months at a time where he's not in, in uh, range of Wi-Fi or any cell connection at all. And sometimes his, 
his GPS runs out of batteries. He's actually really good about making sure it's on all the time. And I urge him, keep that thing on all the time or we don't know where you are. Um, but for a, a great majority of the walk so far, I'd, I'd say at least you know, 95, maybe 96 or 97 percent, he's had very precise GPS locations. And so with modern mapping technology, um, it's very straightforward to take GPS. So this map GPS, is evolving as he's going along. Evolving as he goes along. Also, uh, you know, I was looking at some of the modeling that you did for the maps, uh, and it was fascinating, uh, you know, the, the animation piece that you showed us for the 22 sites, you know, and how if you stretch it out. So, you know, many of us look at the map with uh, with a Europe-centric or a Mediterranean-centric. I mean, Mediterranean is in the center, and then you have the whole world. Sure. But if you look at the map from any other point, I mean, the world looks very different. And in this case, you've actually stretched it out from Africa. Exactly. And it shows as though the entire, uh, entire landmass is connected from Africa to South America. It's fascinating. Yeah, so if you think about our, our, our Earth, it's, 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 it's spherical in shape. It's not an exact sphere, but it's round. And if, if you're thinking about you know, the path of human migration, it goes not just you know, east to west or north to south, it goes around the Earth, and it's very much a three-dimensional shape. So if you have a globe, which is the best representation of the Earth, and you look at the globe, all you can see is half of the globe at once. So this is why what we, we have something called map projections, where you can take um, any sort of shape and, and wrap it around the globe. Most often used is a cylinder. So if you imagine a cylinder of paper wrapped around the globe and it touches the globe at the equator, and then you transfer all of the um, locations onto that piece of paper, then you can flatten that paper out. And that's the most common uh, map we see, the one you, you said where you know, sort of Europe and, and Mediterranean is, is in the center, um, and then the Americas are on the left, and then Asia is, is on the right. Well, you can take any shape you want, wrap it around the globe, and, and flatten that out. The projection that I've chosen to show his walk in is called the Fuller projection developed by a scientist, Mr. Fuller, and it's actually a 22-sided shape, um, a polyhedron around the Earth. And then when it's flattened out, you have to take the sides of that shape and determine where to cut it and then lay it out. And so this projection you know, cuts it where there's um, water. And so the result makes the entire, all the land masses of the Earth look like a connected archipelago. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very disorienting to see the Earth this way. Like you said, we're very used to seeing it a certain way. But if you imagine being anywhere on Earth looking any different direction, things are going to look different. And so I was trying to illustrate this 21,000 mile journey and take it from its real, its true, you know, three-dimensional nature and flatten it out and show it, show the, the, the sheer length of it as, as best as possible. So that's only one third of the world, of the known world. So let's talk about bathymetrics and, and what, what the oceans hide. I mean, it, it's fascinating. And I, as you were saying, that man has tried to understand the ocean bed since 1900. Where have we reached and what does modern technology allow that? Right. So, so back in the early 1900s, um, we, we couldn't map the deep oceans because, you know, sending a chain down miles is, is not feasible, right? It would sink your boat because it would be so heavy. And, and so as technology evolved, um, sonar has been used to map the oceans. So this is, um, you know, ships with, with a, a, a sonar instrument that sends sound waves down. And then the sound waves bounce off of the ocean floor. And then there's a receiver on the ship that receives those sound waves. And so based on the frequency of the sound waves, they know how fast it travels, and then they can calculate how, how long it takes to go down and then come back up and plot the distance from sea level down to the ocean floor. So this has been done um, on very granular, very detailed levels along the coasts and in many bays. You think about shipping and, and you know, all the ships coming into harbors, you need to know the depth to the bottom so your ships don't run aground. Now, the oceans, as you mentioned, are so vast, right? 70% of our planet is, is ocean. And so in the open ocean, we don't have that granular level of, of data. However, ships have crossed um, at a, um, a fine enough distance to get enough information for us to make pretty detailed maps of things like um, the Marianas Trench and you know, subfloor sub volcanoes, places um, like, like Hawaii, 
The, the volcanoes on the big island, Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, have, have, have been revealed to actually extend um, from, from the, the ocean surface down something um, around, the, the, um, around 20,000 feet below the ocean surface. So when you take that full mountain, 20,000 plus the 14,000 it is above land, you get, you get a mountain that's more like 30, 30 mountain much higher than Mount Everest. But that's, of course, measuring it from the ocean floor. So it's all about the, the frame of reference. One of the incredible things about this uh, bathymetry mapping project, it's an international effort. Uh, many nations have contributed to this. And they've all come together and made this data set available um, for free of charge. And you can go download that data set. And if you have mapping software, then you can load that data into your mapping software. And then you can symbolize it with certain colors. So what I did is I took this data and all of the um, bathymetry elevations from uh, sea level down to 100 meters below sea level. Um, I just colored a light gray. And so, so on this greatest walk map, that's how I, I symbolize how land um, looked 70,000 years ago. You know, uh, Harvard has a huge collection of maps. So, yeah. And as a cartographer, I mean, you would have great, uh, you know, interest in studying some of the old maps. Tell us about the maps that stood out for you. So, yeah, the Harvard map collection is, is one of the, the most extensive in the world. There's over 400,000 uh, paper maps, and there's over 8,000 um, digital maps. And so this is a, a place on the Harvard campus that's open to the public, and anyone can go there. It was established 200 years ago, um, but collections have been donated and the university has, has purchased other map collections. And so some of the maps date back to um, the 1400s. And there are some globes made by uh, Descartes that are from the 1500s. That's one of my favorite ones. Um, a, another one of my favorite ones is, is done by a, a, um, a Swiss cartographer, Erwin, Erwin Reitz. And he makes maps that are not just you know, page size, but 20 feet long, 30 feet long that show, um, you know, cr like cross sections across continents that show the topography from, say, the west coast of South America all the way to the east coast of South America. And it's truly art where the, the styles and the colors used um, are, are, are beautiful. And, you know, the, the calligraphy used on, on the, the typography is, is just a joy to look at, yet it's showing us a part of the world true to how it is. Sounds exciting, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. You. Cartography is truly fascinating. Well, thanks so much for joining us and do catch us on our YouTube channel and subscribe to it. Goodbye.